Welcome to this lesson on variables, memory locations, assignments, and calculations. After studying this chapter, you should be able to understand the relationship between variables, memory locations, and current data values assigned to a variable at different points of a program's execution. Achieve a clear understanding of the Visual Basic Assignment Operator, equal sign. Difference between equal sign symbols use for assignment versus comparison operations, difference between equal sign assignment operations in VB and equations or equivalents in algebra and mathematics, know that the storage variable must be on the left hand side of an assignment operator, gain familiarity with the arithmetic operations modulo, integer division, and rounding, how they differ from standard division, Become familiar with the purpose and use of the triparse method. And finally, understand the difference between constants and variables and why constants are needed and useful. I think in order to really cement our understanding of variables, it really helps to see variables in action um, with the debugger in a running program. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to beg your indulgence uh, because we're going to switch over. This is a Windows Forms application that I'm going to use to demonstrate this. But notice that the uh, extension here is .cs rather than VB. And so I've switched uh, to the C-sharp language, and I apologize for that. But the reason that this demonstration is going to be much easier in a little bit different language than VB is that Visual Basic uh, depends entirely on on, uh, in the .NET framework on uh, a managed memory model. And that means that the runtime engine um, completely hides from the programmer the complexities of the physical location of memory. And in fact, even in C-sharp, it does the same thing. But C-sharp, I have uh, some um, available functionality that allows me to say, hey, I want this structure, this variable, to be wired in and not subject to that uh, memory management. So if I put it someplace, I want it to stay there, um, and I want to do that so that we can see the association with uh, with the non-managed memory, with the variable. When we set the variable, you can see if you go look at a particular address in memory, that's where the variable is. And if we were doing it in uh, Visual Basic, number one, it's a little bit more complicated to get the actual physical address in memory where something is stored, because we're not, we normally uh, deal with the memory manager, it handles all that for us. And uh, the other thing is, even if I get it, um, it's likely to move things around as my program, as my computer is running and memory is uh, reshuffled and reused for, for different things and organized and optimized, which the, uh, uh, the uh, free store manager, the memory manager is doing for us all the time. And so that would make things very confusing. And, and so we uh, borrowed C Sharp's ability to use fixed memory. And the other thing is I've got a feature turned on here, which is the memory map, um, which is available in the pro versions of Visual Studio for VB, but it's hidden and turning it on and, and uh, making use of it is, is complicated. And the reason that they, they hid it away in VB is because, again, uh, it's not really ordinary Generally speaking, giving you very useful information because things keep you know moving around in memory. We don't we don't really get that view of it. But C C sharp uh, still inherits a lot of the legacy uh, C plus plus and C capability. So we're going to uh, wire things up in memory here. So a little long-winded explanation on why we're doing it this way. But in other respect, the code is similar to VB code and the, the form is exactly the same. So what I have here is a go button. That's where all our code is going to be. And then I have two text boxes. And the first is going to give us formatted in hexadecimal the memory address of the variable we're working with. And then the uh, 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 text box over here is going to give us the value stored in the first byte. Now, if we're dealing with a string data type, which is what I'm going to use to illustrate, then if we have a uh, string named Sam, S-A-M, or actually a stored 
uh, the value SAM, S-A-M. The first byte is going to be S, the next byte is going to be A, the next byte after that is going to be M. Um, and I'm just going to simplify that by showing us the first byte. We'll also use the memory map function uh, to see the actual sort of like an x-ray machine into memory and you'll be able to see the SAM and other things stored in memory. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, run this. I've got a, a breakpoint set in the code and what's going to happen uh, just so you can anticipate it is we're going to start the program press the go button which is going to declare uh, a variable uh, that I've called PTR uh, pointer and uh, it's going to store the string SAM SAM um, at the location that's given us uh, by the memory manager and that's going to be wired in and then we can play some games and see the address of that variable we can go x-ray uh, using the debugger the and the memory mapper and see what is actually stored there in raw memory and then we can uh, change our program run it and see how things are going to change. So let's take a look at that. And uh, so I'll hit uh, uh, debug and start debugging. And so here's our window. And if I hit go, it's going to initialize the variable pointer and it's going to look and see what the memory manager, what address it gave us, and that's going to be a hexadecimal number value is the, the usual way that we uh, show those. It could be shown in decimal. Hex is a little bit more uh, com, uh, compact, so we tend to refer to memory addresses in hexadecimal, so we don't have quite so many digits to, to keep track of because they can get quite large. And then the value stored at that address, that first byte, is going to be shown here. So with the variable set to SAM, we should see an S appear here. So let's go. And let's uh, make a note. This ended in 4F8, and there's our S. And it should break here automatically after a few seconds. I had it sleeping for seven seconds before that. And now we can come into the memory manager. So this is, this is our memory map. And we can um, take a look here is the, the value that we're interested. PTR is the name of the variable. And so if I put PTR here and look up that variable, symbolically, it is stored at, oh, there it is, this address ending in 4F8. And there, if you look in, in the raw bytes, we see S.A.M. And the reason we're seeing an empty byte here is that ASCII code can be stored in uh, um, just a single byte, eight bits, but we're using Unicode, and remember that some languages worldwide um, have more characters than can be represented in uh, 256 or 128 character set. Uh, so things like uh, simplified katakana Japanese um, is uh, uh, going to be, you know, a couple thousand characters. That needs a larger um, uh, character set, so it uses two bytes for each character, even though we happen to be working in English and one byte would, would do it. But notice that we see SAM, and indeed, if we move up here or down here through memory, we can scroll through and see other things that are stored in memory, and most of it is not going to make a lot of sense to us kind of hogwash. We may find some some things that, that you'll recognize, but that's because we uh, really haven't set any values there. And just looking at the raw contents of memory, some of that is non-ASCII code. It's a binary code. And so when you map it over in this window to the ASCII equivalent, it isn't necessarily useful. But if we go back to where our variable is stored, we can see that's SAM. And again, this time it happened to be stored at uh, 36754F8. All right, so let's go ahead and continue the run. Remember that number, 4F8. And there it is. So that is the address, and indeed at that address is S. Okay. If we press go again, we may or may not, probably on the same run, uh, memory is not too dynamic. We're going to end up with this um, 
in the same address for F8. But if we stop the run, so we've stopped debugging, when we run that again, depending on what else has changed in my machine, we may or may not get that same memory address back on the next run of the program. Typically, you won't. So let's say go. Ah, and here it's O2C that it's stored it in. But again, the contents of the variable is still SAM. And so if we go look up, where did the PTR variable get stored this time? Well, this time it happened to get stored in this memory address. And if we look, there it is, SAM. We x-ray into our memory. You can see that's stored there. Okay, so even though the value of the variable we're storing happens to be the same, on different runs of uh, the program, it can be stored. There's our there's our SAM in hex values, S-A-M, and it got stored in a different address. And that address can move around in a mem uh, managed memory machine. Um, we don't really care. As long as the computer keeps track of it, uh, we're happy that it does the most efficient thing with memory that it can do. Okay, so we can see that the location at which a variable is stored can be changed on different runs of the program. But what about changing the variable value itself? All right, well, tell you what, let's do this. Let's come in here, and remember, we've, we've not ended our program, but we did a break of it. Okay, and so at O2C, it was storing SAM. Let's come in here and edit that and make it BOB, and then tell our program to continue. Up. Uh, that's going to force us to restart. All right, we'll probably get a different memory address then. Let's see. So now, when we tell it, yeah, we did get a different memory address. We've got 780 this time. And now the first letter is B. And if we come in here and type, type PTR to look at the variable address, now notice that this time its starting address is uh, 3231780. And here, instead of SAM, we're storing BOB. And you can see that in the clear text over here, the ASCII text. Okay. So the idea here is that as the program runs, the value could change. And it could start out being Bob, and then uh, that could change, and it could be SAM, SAM. Or, and that's why it is a variable. It can vary, and we can update the value. Um, if we're storing a number and then we need to add to the number or subtract from the number, it will update as the program is running. The variable, while the program runs, will be attached to some location in memory. There's the address of, of the location in memory. And for that run of the program, generally speaking, um, you know, stepping aside from the question of managed memory where things can be moving around on you, but it updates the symbolic reference for that variable. That the, uh, the address is going to be fixed and the contents of the variable can change. Between runs of the program, so I run, stop this program and run it again, the next time I may get mapped into a totally different location in memory. So let's go ahead and uh, see that. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at some of the internals, what's going on here. So let's stop this run and run it again. Tell it go. And so B, this time it's stored at 170. And let's update this. And there's our address for the, the PTR variable. And there's BOB, okay. And so let's take a look at our variable watch window. So I switch from my memory window to the watch window. And here's a few different things. So here's the value in the, we're watching the variable PTR. And this tells us the um, uh, uh, value stored in PTR. And then, uh, let's see, if we're done with that. And here is PTR formatted as an integer variable rather than as hex, okay? 
and then let's take a look at the thing pointed at. in that variable. So this is the address of the variable. This is the contents of that variable, b as in b-o-b. Okay, so what if we change that? Can we change that with the immediate window? I'm not sure we can do that. Let's give that a try. So instead of Bob, let's see if we can change it to Rob. Uh, Okay, and so no, let's go back to PTR and notice that having manually using the immediate command window, we've changed that to ROB. Okay, now if this was the first B changed to an R and that was at address 170, so then the next address is 171, 172, so 170, 171, 172, 173, 174. Let's change 174. Okay, so that's our original one plus 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's change that to a T. So this should change the, the trailing B from Rob to Rot. Oh, can't do it. Alrighty, what if we do it this way? All right, so we've changed that. Let's see what our memory map tells us now. Oh, I was off by a couple. I changed that too many. Oh, too many, because each byte is a double byte. I didn't need to add four to it. I need to add two to it. Let's go fix that. So let's make this plus two equals T. There we go. And now let's look at our memory map. And there it is. Okay, so that is what is going to happen as you update variables when you assign it a new value, is it's storing back to the same memory location the updated information. And this also is useful to, for talking about data types. So um, the, the string that we're talking about here is a series of bytes uh, for uh, we started out with the name um, uh, Sam, S-A-M, okay, which is going to take three bytes or in a double byte character set, it's going to take a total of six bytes. It's important that we choose the correct data type for efficiency in how we consume memory. And if you take a look in your uh, textbook reference or look up online the sizes of the different data types, you'll find that different data types use a different number of bytes. And so you want to use the smallest data type that will get the job done. So for instance, if we're only dealing with um, whole numbers, we can use an integer data type. And that's, relatively speaking, uses less bytes than, for example, a floating point or decimal data type, which takes substantially more bytes. So if there's no reason to be using a decimal, we can make our code more efficient and consume less space by using this, the more compact data type. And I think we'll leave it here for now. Let's take a moment to discuss what I feel is a rather uh, unfortunate 
choice in basics design, and that's inherited also in Visual Basic, with regard to what we use as the symbol for both the comparison operator and the assignment operator in VB. And this throws some students, particularly if you were pretty good at uh, good old high school or college entry level algebra. So if we look at what we learned in algebra, the equivalence or comparison operator was the equal sign. And so you could create expressions for equations like this, x equals 3 plus 2. And uh, you could uh, then evaluate that x had to be equal to 5. But it was just as reasonable. The left hand and right hand side are, are of the equal sign. And an equation are uh, being set as equivalent. And so we could just as easily say 3 plus 2 equals x. And that was completely OK. It didn't matter whether the symbolic or variable representation was on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. That was algebra. Ha. Uh, not so much in VB. Um, unfortunately, there is a handedness to the assignment operator in VB. So if we are trying to assign a, a value to variable x, x must be stated first. So x may be equal to 3 plus 2. That's a perfectly good expression. However, if we do something like this, 3 plus 2 equals the variable x, the problem here is there is a handedness. So it's going to process, this is the storage area for this. The problem is that these are not variables. These are literal values, and they are constant values. They cannot be changed. 3 is 3, and 2 is 2. And so it's nonsensical to try and evaluate the left-hand side of an assignment operator in this way. So let's go ahead and just kind of mark that as wrong. <laughs> Uh, not allowed. And uh, again, I think it's unfortunate that they used the equal sign for this purpose because we are really not uh, making a statement of equivalence. We are doing something that is just a little bit different. We are assigning it. I would rather have wished that uh, it did something like Microsoft Word. Let's uh, change this back to black because this is actually we'll make it green because this is what I'm speculating this would have been nice okay uh, is that X could be assigned the value 3 plus 2 if you'd used a different symbol and if you did it that way then if you wanted to parse and allow the expression to be read this way you could have written it either way because we would be using a non-ambiguous um, operator. This this arrow sign isn't used for anything else in, uh, well, uh, not in most of algebra. There are some, some uh, other mathematical branches that use a, a notation um, similar to the, the arrow, but we could, we could use that. It would be not confusing, but um, be that as it may, um, that's not how life is, so we're going to have to get used to it. So let's just delete everything that was speculative and everything that was wrong and say when we are assigning in VB, okay, variable must be on left. And let's make that a rule. Okay. Now, having sorted out the assignment operator, there are times when we are not assigning a value, we are asking a question. And we would like to know, in this case, is it true that x is equal to 3 plus 2? So we're really asking a question, but there's no question mark. We do that this way. And the only distinction in the way that this expression appears is you'll know that we are doing a comparison because there is a comparison statement, and that's our if statement. And usually, although not always, we will wrap that expression in parentheses. And if this is true, then, and we would have some statement for the true part, and then we could have 
an else statement if we wanted to provide what happens if it's not true, the false part, and then we would end the if statement. Okay, and so um, again, this is kind of confusing because it's really easy to read that and say, well, that looks just like an assignment operator. So if X was work equal to something else, is it gonna become equal to three plus two, which is to say five? Up here, that's exactly what would happen. X would become five. In this, though, X is gonna remain unchanged. So if there was a previous statement up here that said um, dim X as integer equals seven, okay, is a former statement. It's not going to, add, to assign five here, even though this looks just like an assignment statement. Doesn't that drive you a little bit nuts? It certainly makes me nuts. Now, other languages that are a little bit more rational, a little bit more modern, such as C++, would say, you know, let's use a different operator and it uses a, replete, a, a repeated equal sign. I think it would have been fun to do something like equals question mark. Does x equal to three plus two? Then that's that's really clear that we're doing a test. And C plus plus says, well, do equal equal. So this makes it clear. So one is the assignment, and the other one is the comparison. And um, again, you know, um, this is Bjorn Strustrup's way. That's he was the father of C plus um, plus. This would be Beck's way, and I'm not the father of uh, any programming languages, unfortunately. Um, maybe I need to get busy, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, unfortunately, we are stuck with the way that BASIC does it. So we're going to need to learn to watch for these cues and look at the expression. Is it wrapped in a comparison clause? Is the if in there, in which case we're doing a comparison. If not, we're doing an assignment. Now, um, that's, uh, you know, that's the difference that we're going to have to keep in mind then. And if that wasn't enough, there are some variations in VB. These are kind of handy. And those are other assignment operators. So variations on assignment operator. Okay. And this is going to use plus equal and minus equal notation. So let's start out by saying x has been assigned, declared as, a, as an integer, and it has been assigned the value 7. OK, so currently x is 7. Now I could say x plus equals one what the heck does this mean that is shorthand for this it says x equals x plus one and now we got to get into that whole left hand right hand thing again so when we started out x equals seven okay and so what's happening here the seven on the right hand is added to one, which makes eight. And so the result down here, if we were to console.writelin x, what we would see on our screen would be eight. Similarly, if we were to make this plus equals three, seven and three would be 10. So what this plus equals is saying is take whatever is already in X and add the expression on the right to it, okay? We can do play the same game with minus equals, okay? So if we said X was seven, X minus equal three, let's get this out of the way because it's just confusing. then x minus equals three, then when x was printed, if it was seven and minus equal, which is the same as saying x 
equals x minus 3. So this x was 7. 7 minus 3 is 4. So what we would get printed out is 4. So just to recap, we have the assignment. And unlike algebra, where we could test equivalence or make an equation with the variable on either side of the equation, the assignment operator in VB, the variable to receive the result is on the left hand side and the right hand side is going to be whatever the expression is here no matter how complex we could make this much more complex times 3 uh, minus 72 uh, di divided by 8 um, plus 2 raised to the fifth power however complex we wanted to make this this whole thing is going to be evaluated first once that number has been crunched and calculated, then it will be stored in the address of variable x. Okay. Now the comparison operator again. Comparison asks the question, is this true? And we use exactly the same symbol. As I said, drives me nuts. But we're asking the question, is this true? If x is equal to 3 plus 2, so what's the computer going to do? It's first going to evaluate the right-hand side and say 3 plus 2 is 5. Then it's going to say, is x, whatever the value is stored in x, is it equal to 5? If it is, then this code that uh, is the true part is going to be executed, and else this code that is the false part, that will be executed. So we can make a decision based on the comparison. Okay, and then finally, we can use the variations on the assignment operator, which are plus equals and minus equals and other operators as well. So uh, plus equals, minus equals, are we going to incrementally add something to the existing value of x without changing it or subtract or decrement the, the value of x without um, without first clearing the, the value. Okay, so um, these expressions, as I said, uh, x minus equal 3 is the equivalent to x equals x minus 3. If that's clearer, you're totally free to use that unless the assignment is calling you to practice using this new different assignment operator, in which case follow the instructions. You can also say x plus equals 3, and that is totally the same space that out for readability as x equals x plus 3. One final word on this. This drives you nuts if you were a good algebra student because one of the things you're trying to do in algebra, you, you're you going to be trained, you've trained your mind to read this as an equation, and you know that x can't be a rational number if x plus is the same as x plus 3 because you know nothing that is three more than itself is equal to itself. That's just that's just not sensible. But again, we're not uh, creating an equation here. So you got to train your your mind to read this in the context of programming when you're doing programming, and in terms of algebra when you're doing algebra. Heaven help you if you are taking an algebra class at the same time you are taking your programming class. Um, that'll really drive you batty. Uh, but with a little focus and concentration. Uh, you can keep things straight. Okay, so let's just take this and uh, and play with it in the context of some code. So here I have a uh, uh, Visual Studio console app running, and I've already declared some code. Dim x as decimal, dim y as decimal. I think before I was using integers, I've made them decimals here in case we want to play around with it a little bit. And here I've said x is assigned the value 3 plus 2, y is just assigned the value 5, and then I'm outputting x is equal to whatever x is, and we output the variable there, y equals y. And if it is true that x equals y, then here's the true part print x equals y is true, and if that's not the case, print that x equals y is false, and uh, then uh, in the if, and here I just have a read key to hold the window open so it doesn't flash by too fast for us to read. So let's do a little thought experiment here, sort of a quick test. 
So I, this should print what? X equals five, Y equals five, and since those two are true, it should also print out the line X equals Y is true. Let's see what it actually does. Here's our code, and it says x equals 5, y equals 5, x equals y is true. Great. Okay. So let's say what if we change this to x equals 3 minus 2, which is to say x is equal to negative 1. Let's see how that changes things. What's it going to do? Give yourself a self-test. What are we going to get output? x is now going to be equal to 1. Y is still equal to 5, and now the false part should become true, so we should just get this message, X equals Y is false. Let's see if that works. X equals 1, Y equals 5, X equals Y is false, just as we expected. Very good. Alrighty. Now let's play with some things. And here I want to talk about something that you may have seen before in elementary school or in uh, maybe an intro college math class, and that is PEMDAS. And PEMDAS is an acronym that uh, we remember by saying, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And what does that help us to remember? What is that a, a, a mnemonic for? It is, P is, permutation, no, no, P is parentheses. Plural parentheses. And E is exponentiation. And M is, is multiplication D is division and A is addition and S is subtraction. Okay, so why why remember PEMDAS for all these math operators. You you know all these math operators by now. This is the order of operations. So anything in parentheses has to be evaluated first. After that, any exponents that are outside of parentheses are then evaluated, then multiplication, then division, then addition, and then finally subtraction. And those of, of you that remember the associative rules uh, are going to say, well, it doesn't matter whether I do addition or subtraction first, and it also doesn't matter if I do division or multiplication first, so long as this pair is done before this pair. And that's true, but uh, we had to come up with one way of remembering it that would be right, so we usually use PEMDAS rather than uh, PEMSA. Um, so let's just remember it that way. And let's see how that works. So let's have some parentheses. 3 minus 2 times, let's see, let's have some, uh, let's change this a little round, around a little bit. Let's make it 3 minus 1. And then let's raise that to the second power. And then let's uh, divide this. Let's do this. Let's make this 16 divided by this number. Let's throw some addition up here. Plus 2. Uh, let's make it plus 3. And so we got subtra subtraction, addition, um, multiplication. Ah, we need some multiplication. And then let's uh, multiply this by 5. So we've got addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. We've got some parenthetical grouping, and we've got um, uh, the parentheses. We've got everything. So let's do this. Now, without the grouping, let's say 16 slash 3 minus 1 
raised to the second power plus 3 times 5. Okay, so here's the difference. The parentheses are going to be done first. Here, without the parentheses, they're not going to be done first. But in any event, we're going to follow the order of operations. If you weren't following the order of operations, if you were just going from left to right, you might be thinking, is this true? So 16 divided by 3 is going to be 5.3, we'll use an approximation, 5.3 repeating. Okay, and then we're going to say minus 1 would be 4.3 raised, raised to the second power. Okay, um, I'm going to go get calc. And... Let's say 4.3, oop, let me clear that. Four point three. Ah, it's not seeing my decimal point. Oh, I'm in programmer mode. Let's go standard. Four point three times four point three equals eighteen point four nine. Okay, so you might be thinking, oh, it's 18.49 once I square that, and then I'm adding 3, so that's going to make 2149, and then I'm going to multiply that by 5, back to my calc, Twenty-one point four nine times... 5, you say, well, this is going to be 107.45, and of course, we couldn't be more wrong, because we've ignored the proper uh, um, order of operations. So let's see what happens when we really run this. Okay, so x equals 19, y equals 19.33333. And x is not equal to y, and so why the change in order, uh, change in, in between these two? One other thing that's happening here is that uh, at some point we are not using an explicit decimal type. So if we want to make sure we pr use the decimal position uh, or precision, we could come up here and make sure that these are all interpreted as decimal values. And let's run that again. Oh, I've still got somewhere it's that that were we're rounding or truncating. But the uh, long and short of it is that the order of operations must be preserved. Oh, here's the problem. It's, they shouldn't be equal. And that is because 3 minus 1, if done first, is going to be 2 squared is 4. This one, the order of operations says that we're going to do exponentiation first. So it's 1 raised to the second power, which is still 1. 3 minus 1, this becomes 2. Whereas this 3 minus 1 is 2 raised to the second power became 4. So we've got some, some other changes in here. And you just got to work through the order of operations. But in any event, by no means was it processed simply left to right. The order of operations, operator precedence, uh, comes into play. So, you know, we got to be explicit about our groupings. So just to show that this is equivalent, 3 minus 1 is 2. And let's run that. And now 19 is 19 and x equals y is true. So we have to watch our order of operations. And if we want it to be explicitly 
Um, you know, we want to do some subtraction before other things. Subtraction would normally be the lowest uh, uh, precedence operator. It would be done last. Then what we need to do is use parentheses to group it, make that happen sooner. And so we remember PEMDAS. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. We just say first we do everything in parentheses, then exponents, multiplication, division, addition, and finally subtraction. There are a few other operators that you can run into uh, occasionally. And, and if you're doing those that kind of math, uh, pull out your, your math textbook and see where it sits in terms of operator precedence. Um, uh, but those are, you know, this is your 90% uh, plus case of what you're going to run into day-to-day. Uh, -day. Let's continue our exploration of variables and also see how the variables relate to the uh, text property of text boxes, the relationship we have between those. And especially, let's uh, explore the triparse function and let's uh, try to understand why that is necessary. So here I have a simple VB Forms uh, Windows app. Uh, I've got uh, three text box up, uh, first num, second num, and uh, the result. And I've got a little go button. And we're simply going to write a program that is going to take whatever we enter in the first text box, add it to the second text box, and store that in the third text box. So it seems really straightforward. And uh, let's do this in kind of a naive way. So let's start by uh, putting the logic in for our go button. And uh, we could start with an assumption that what we want to do is take uh, the text box uh, result uh, text and make that equal to whatever the text is entered in the first plus the text entered in the second. Well, let's see how that works out for us. Okay. So uh, let's put in a number uh, uh, 2 and 3. And 2 plus 3 should equal uh, 5. Uh-oh, uh 23. Wait, what's going on here? Uh, OK, uh, this is the first number. And this is the second number. Oh, wait, this is first number, second. Oh, I see what's happening here. So we aren't really getting addition here because the text property of the text box is a data type string. OK, so it's it's text. So it's taking the text. So it's not interpreting the plus as the the addition operator. It's seeing that as concatenation. It's literally just sticking them together. So um, it is interpreting text as text and we need to convert it to a number well the problem is that if we're using a text box to gather our input it's always going to start out as text so we need to somehow turn that text into a uh, a number well there's a there's a nifty little function that will do that um called parse and uh, we could, uh, so we really like to make this, let's see, let's allow floating point values. So uh, a decimal type and let's parse it. And uh, that should take uh, this and turn it into a number. It'll read that. And if, if we've entered a number, it will uh, turn that into a number. And let's do that here, decimal dot parse the second. OK, so we've got a number and a number. So those are our number. We'll put those into the text box. Let's see how that works for us. OK, so two and three and go. And f that seems to work. Wow. You know, something magical just happened here. And that is VB did something for us. It used an implicit conversion because this is a numeric type, and this is a numeric type, and this is a string type of text. Okay, so what it did for us is it took this whole thing, it recognized that we're trying to convert between data types, and in this case, very obligingly, it made the correct guess and converted it uh, to string. 
Okay, so it's the same as if we explicitly did that. Let's see if that still runs. It should. Okay, so let's make it 33 and 22 and go and 55. So it, it did that for us. And so in some ways, it's really nice that Visual Basic will do the implicit conversion, the implied conversion for us to the correct type. Where that can bite us is if we got sloppy and it converts to a type and we really didn't want it for some reason to convert to a type that works as for, far as the program operation, but maybe is not what we intended with regard to our logic. So we need to be a little bit careful. And so you might think, well, this is cool. It's it's all working. I understand that. And, and this is going to work just fine. Well, not so much. Uh, ABC plus XYZ and go and program crashes. We need to pr protect our program from crashing. Why did this crash? Well, let's stop the program and think about it. So we entered in the first text box, ABC, and it parsed that into a, oh, it can't parse it into a decimal because ABC is nonsensical. And yet we didn't do anything to disallow the user from entering an invalid uh, or nonsensical entry. And that would really be the best thing for us to do. And so it's, uh, it's kind of messed things up here. All right, well, what we really need is a variant of the parse operation that says, you know, parse it if it can be parsed. And if it can't be parsed, I want you either to give me an error, you know, a code that I can read and then say, well, this didn't work. I need to do something different or just ignore it. Okay, there is a function that will do that. But in order to get there, let's clean our code up a little bit because we're doing things with conversions on the fly here. And you see how complex this statement is starting to get. And really where we wanna do most of our calculations and operations are in variables, not in the properties of the objects, okay? So let's break this, so stop debugging. And let's come back here and uh, let's put this one aside for now and let's declare some variables okay so you notice i've mirrored with um, my naming uh, pretty closely the names of the uh, properties the text box properties that i'm going to be working with so i'd call the first text box um, uh, result and or the, actually where we're going to end up is in the result and then there's the the first num text box and the second num text box so I've created three decimal variables that have those names and that's because I'm going to pull the values out of those text boxes and put them into the variables and I do that like this so here I'm doing a decimal cast so I'm convert trying to convert to a decimal and I'm using the try parse method. And this works a little bit different from the parse. Instead of just parsing this thing and returning it, it parses this thing and it stores it in this variable, okay? And the way try parse, as the name implies, works is if it can parse it, it will put the, the value in there. Otherwise, it's gonna leave that value um, unchanged. Okay, and by default, what is what is the uh, um, you now some programming languages don't create a default value for uh, a newly uh, declared variable, but um, uh, for numeric variables, VB does. We probably should do it explicitly. We can do that like this. We say when we declare first num, set it to zero, and that's really what it's going to be set to. And same thing here, and let's just be consistent. And so it is always a best practice to initialize to a desired starting value if possible. Um, or, you know, you might put it into a, put a, a, a number that would invalid. So you notice if it never got updated, you would have a code that you could check for or value you could check for and say, hey, you know, this variable didn't get updated properly. Because uh, that's exactly what's going to happen with triparse. The way we're writing it right now is we're not this actually this triparse generates a return code. Um, so we could have, you know, if we click created a, a, a variable called uh, uh, return code, we could say return code is equal to that. Then we could check the return code to see what was the value that it returned. 
and we could add additional logic for that, but we're trying to keep this a little simple. So this is simply going to um, put the, the, the string value uh, converted to a number into first num if it works, and if it doesn't work, it's going to leave it alone, which means it's still going to be zero. Okay, and then same thing with second num. So now we've got first num and second num, and then what we need to do is we need to take and store into result the sum of first num and second num. Now, I don't have to convert anything here because second num is a decimal type, first num is a decimal type, my result is a decimal type, and I can add a decimal to a decimal and safely store the result in a decimal. Uh, I'm not going to get anything that's, that, that wouldn't work as a decimal as a result. Okay, so now I've got my result variable, but I need to put the result variable into this text property. Okay, so I could say that equals my result, and will that work? It should work because of that implicit conversion. Let's go ahead and test that and see if this is working. So we'll run our code, and let's try uh, 23 and 32, and go, and hey, 55. Now let's test, let's mess with it. Um, funky entry plus 32 equals 32. So it just ignored this, and now our program does not crash. We have made uh, more resilient code. Now, we need to think about whether this is acceptable when somebody puts something silly in here that we still do that. Is that the desired result, or do we need to go a little bit further and check to make sure and, and give an error message to the user? Hey, you know, you didn't enter a number here, only numbers are allowed, um, you know, or do something uh, to prevent an invalid entry being made on the text box. We're going to cover those techniques later, but for now we've improved our code so that it does something more reasonable and acceptable, and if that meets our, our criteria, then we're good. But let's uh, uh, take a look at one other thing that's bothering me. This is a decimal type, and we're throwing it into a text, uh, a string value, and it's doing an implicit conversion. It really bothers me when we do that. And we can, um, actually there's a setting that we'll study later that we can um, uh, change it so that implicit conversions are not done and professional programmers typically will turn that on. It is a best practice. Um, it's really kind of a legacy thing that, that we allow VB's behavior in this way to um, store or do implicit conversions for us. As I said, it can get you into trouble, and so a really tip-top programmer is going to turn the uh, implicit off, and uh, you know, or or turn explicit declarations or explicit uh, conversions on, and force that so that you never accidentally do something that allows the program work to work, but work in the sense that it doesn't crash, but it returns a result that that really is not what you intend. And so, what we really should do is cast this to a string and using the two string method and now let's test it and make sure that that's still working and uh, let's try something nonsensical ABC XYZ and I should get a zero and I do what about if I add uh, 23.5 to uh, 1.5 And uh, that's working, and so good. So now we have a robust program doing what we're supposed to be doing. And again, the thing to remember here, the principles that we're learning is that the um, text property, although we can do a lot of conversions on it, and in fact, we could find a way to convert all this down to a, a single, long, very complex statement, um, don't do it. Uh, we want code to be simple, easy to read, understandable, and efficient. And efficiency is important, but it doesn't matter how efficient your code is if no one can understand or maintain it. So um, let's do this. For every property we're going to be working with, um, it's a really good practice to create a variable. Move the, um, uh, the text property um, uh, from the object or whatever the property is into a local variable 
do your calculations, do your manipulations on it, and then when you're all done, put that back into the um, properties of the object where they belong and for display or output or uh, additional processing by the object. And so um, uh, this this is a best practice and makes lots of sense. So let's let's try and do it that way. It'll keep us out of trouble, and we can also see why triparse is important and useful. Uh, it gives us the behavior we want of converting uh, a value if it is possible to do so, and if not, um, it keeps our program from crashing. And again, the way we're working uh, using this right now, we're not looking at the re return code from attempting the triparse. It actually is going to uh, give us a true if it if it succeeded. It'll give us a false logical value if it didn't. So we could test that, and so we could say, hey, try parsing it this way. If that didn't work, uh, do this other thing. And if that didn't work, do this other thing. And you know, so we could we could have several different options if, if there's a lot of flexibility in what the user might legitimately enter that we. We can try and figure out how to process the user's input so in a more sophisticated or complex program we would do that for now we're just trying it and we're if it if it fails we're just going on leaving things at zero and that's acceptable based on uh, what we wanted to do with this particular program Aside from operator precedence, which we've already discussed in an earlier segment, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, explaining the uh, arithmetic operators, which by and large work as you would expect, and you're going to be exploring those in your exercises and assignments. Uh, but I would like to look at some arithmetic operators that you don't often encounter in standard math, but we use quite a bit in programming. And these are, uh, aside from the standard division operator, uh, which we'll use for comparison, they are the modulo operator, the uh, integer division operator, and the rounding operator. And so what I've set up here is uh, two entry uh, boxes and a list box. Uh, you're going to put the, the dividend, the thing to be divided or operated on, will go in this text box, the divisor or the number by which it will be divided or operated on is in the second box. And then the result, depending on the operation, uh, will be listed in this list box here when you press the Go button. So let's explore how this code actually operates. So um, here's my click event for the button. And I've made some comments here to uh, make it clear what this program does. So we're going to first uh, just do an operation with standard division, which is going to give you um, uh, what you would expect. So if we uh, come out evenly, it will divide evenly. And if not, uh, so 9 divide 5, you would expect to get a, a fractional result. Modulo division, the mod operator, is remember when you were learning long division and you, you had the quotient part and then you had the remainder. Um, the modulo division returns the remainder only. And this is, you would think that wouldn't be very useful, but it's enormously useful in programming. So things that we can use uh, the, you know, what is the fractional result left over? If you wanted to know how, what, what time of day, if it is currently noon, what time of day is it going to be in 25 hours? Well, you could kind of figure that out, but modulo dividing by 24 hours in a day will say, well, the, the, the remainder, 25 divided by 24, goes one time, remainder one. We throw away the, the, the quotient and just get keep the remainder, which is one. That's one hour. We add that to noon. Noon plus one hour is going to be, oh, one in the afternoon. Modulo will do that for us. It's great for doing um, time arithmetic, date arithmetic, days of the week. How you know what day will it be in in 73 days from now? Well, we do that modulo seven, and so you know well 73 divided by seven is going to go evenly 10 times with three remainder. And if today happens to be Monday, add three days: Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It'll be Thursday um, in 73 days. So uh, it's really kind of handy to be able to do modulo division. Integer division is sort of the flip side of modulo division. Modulo division returns only the remainder. Integer division returns only the quotient. And that's good for all kinds of things where we don't care about the leftover part. So let's say we're cooking 
you know, we, we need to know how many pies, if we have this much flour and this many eggs and this much sugar, um, you know, how, how many whole pies can I make um, so that I, you know, don't end up spoiling the recipe by using too much or uh, sugar or running too short of flour. How many whole cups, for example, uh, are available in what I in what I have? So integer division, when I divide uh, one number from another, returns the whole number part only. So 75 or uh, let's say 70 divided by two, well that would be 35. What about 75 divi divided by two? Should be 37 and a half. The whole number would just be 37 okay so we can make 37 whole pies we're not going to try and cook half a pie that's not going to turn out happily um, so lots of reasons why energy division is very practical and then there's rounding and rounding is useful in all kinds of calculations scientific and fiscal for doing finance you know are we going to charge the customer do we round up do we round down and uh, standard rounding uh, or five-fourths rounding, we're going to, you know, everything that's uh, a half or less, so if it ends in 0.5 or less, uh, excuse me, if it's under 0.5, we're going to round it down. If it's 0.5 or more, we're going to round it up. And so that gives you the, the rounding you would ex, uh, expect. There are other kinds of rounding we won't go into. Uh, there are functions for them. Banker's rounding is a special kind of rounding. Um, Again, the kind of specialized use for certain kinds of uh, fiscal or statistical operations. We're just going to stick with our familiar um, rounding, uh, which breaks on the uh, half uh, mark. Okay, so the comments tell us what this is going to do. Here's how we've set it up. Um, based on the best practice I introduced in an earlier video segment, I've set up variables to store and work with the values we're going to gather from our input boxes. Here's our familiar triparse. We're converting to decimal, so decimal triparse, and we're going to get the inputs from the text dividend text box and text divisor text box, and we're going to store the results if they parse correctly into dividend and divisor. And then li, that's my list box. Uh, I'm starting out by saying, hey, let's just make sure if, if we've run this program several times that we cleared the, the text box since the last run. So this clears out anything that's in the text box to start nice and clean. And then here we just apply our operations. So a uh, forward uh, slash, a standard forward slash gives us standard division. And here's what we are usually expecting and familiar with with division. This is going to give us um, the fractional number if, if a fraction is involved, and that's going to be very familiar to us. And then here's our modulo, and then our, notice this is a backward slash. That is integer division is going to give us only the whole number part. And then finally, here we're using the math library and calling the round function. And we're going to do a standard division here and then call it to round. And it's going to round it up or down as appropriate to, to the nearest whole number. And then under each of those statements where we put the, the value in the result variable, we then take and we're, we're adding it to the collection in the list box. So this is how you add things to a list box so it's not quite the same where you just have dot text there's a collection in the list box of many items so we uh, add it to the items collection and then um, i'm also to make it clear what that is i'm concatenating so this is the usual concatenation operator we can also use the plus sign but it's less ambiguous to use the ampersand sign it means we're, we're definitely working with string values at this point rather than numbers and we're going to say let's add a label to this so it's going to make it clear that first entry was the result of standard division then modulo division then uh, integer division and then rounding all right, so now that we see kind of where we're going with this, let's let's run this and give it a try. Okay, so let's try 75 operated by 2 and go. And so standard division, as we would expect, 75 divided by 2 gives us a fractional part, 37 and a half. Modulo, which is the remainder, so 2 will go into evenly into 74 there's one more so there's one left over the remainder will be one there's our modulo operator and then integer division is going to truncate doesn't round up 
it's always just going to throw away any fractional part. So even if the result had been, you know, 37.99, it would still um, truncate that to give us the the, uh, the the integer part. How many times does it fully go into it? It's 37. And then rounding is going to up or down uh, as appropriate. So if we made this slightly smaller, 74.9, and go, oh, now notice it rounded down because it was less than the half mark. And if we'd made it 75.1, the rounding would round it to 38. And let's go ahead and look at the uh, modulo operator for just a moment. Um, let's make this uh, seven numbers of days in the week. And uh, let's say that today is Monday. What day will it be exactly? Seven days from now. So modulo, modulo, modulo operator says take today's date, Monday, add zero to it. It would still be Monday. If it was eight days from now, it'll say, oh, add one to the day. So Monday, it'll be Tuesday in exactly eight days. What will it be 15 days from now? And you can see what I've done. You can do that in your head. That's two exact weeks, which would be seven and seven is 14 plus one. So you know it's going to be Tuesday again. But here it's done the math for us. And that way, if we end up with a really large number that's harder to do in our head, just looking at it, that says, oh, well, you know what, 315 days, it's going to be Monday again, but in 316 days, it will be Tuesday. Then again, in 314 days, it will be the day before Monday, or Monday plus six days, so it's going to be Sunday. So you can see that that's really uh, a very handy operator. And meanwhile, we're seeing the other things behave as we expect they would. So standard division gives us the, the full fractional number. Uh, modulo division gives us the remainder. Uh, integer division tells us how many times it goes in completely and throws away the remainder. And again, rounding is going to give us proper rounding. And so um, there you have a pretty good survey and can use this as a sample library. This little bit of code right here. Come back to this later if you need to uh, model some code that does any of those mathematical functions to do the calculation at hand at the time. Let's further explore some aspects and behaviors of variables. And uh, what we want to understand is, in, in looking at this, is variable scope. And I think probably the uh, best way to think about uh, variable scope is to perhaps think of California's governor. So if you are in Santa Barbara, the governor is the governor. And if you are in Ventura, the governor is the governor. So the scope of the governor is statewide. So even if you go to a different county, the governor is the governor. If, however, you go to Nevada or Arizona or another state, you have a totally different governor altogether. Okay, and if you go to another country where the um, uh, political organization is different, you may not have a governor at all. It may not, not even be germane. So um, we can do sort of the same things with variables. Variables can exist project-wide, um, form-wide, or at the level of an individual event. Okay, so let's uh, start by seeing something akin to the uh, uh, the governor here. Let's look at uh, global. So here's a, a form variable scope demo, and I've put a couple buttons on it, and I'm elected to use for outputs now instead of um, a text box. I'm going to pop up message boxes, and so let's see how this is going to work. So let's take a look at the form code. Uh, to start with. Okay, yeah, let's see. I'm not really interested in coding up a form event, but that was a quick way to get to the form level declaration. And notice that I have created a public shared variable, um, meaning it can be uh, used by 
any element, any object in this whole project, it's pretty global. Uh, certainly it's, uh, you know, the form and any sub controls on the form can use it, but I've made it public and shared. So other forms would be able to use it as well. It's about as global as we get. So public shared X is a decimal and I've initialized it to five. Okay. So um, anywhere throughout this whole form, um, if we refer to X, we're going to say, hey, if it hasn't changed um, by something else, the, uh, the value is going to be 5, and it will remain 5 until we change it. Okay, so let's take a look now back at the global routine. So here's the click event for the global button. And what this says is that, hey, you know, there's, it doesn't declare x because x has already been declared at the form level we're just going to reference it and it sends out a message global module scope variable x has value and then a concatenation operator and it's going to show us the actual value of x and the message box that we're creating is going to have an ok and cancel button and it's going to have title global module scope and then i've set a breakpoint here remember we could set a breakpoint by or remove it by clicking in the margin. That will cause our code to stop, but not to end the program. It will just stop, freeze in place, and we can use the uh, variable watch window to see what the value of the variables are. And what we would expect is that that variable should be five. We're not changing it anywhere, so it should just stay five. So let's hit F5 and run this code. And here's our code running. Let's click on show global. And indeed, it says global module scope variable X has value 5, exactly what we expected. We say OK, and then the code breaks. And I've already added the variable X to the watch window. And notice down here that there's a little um, difference in the variable showing me that the scope is uh, and the, the access rights on it are a little bit broader than usual. So there's a little widget on that it shows you that it's something different and the value is five and this all works nicely okay now let's uh, go look at the confusing stuff let's go ahead and uh, um, stop debugging and look at our form and what about the code for the show local all right so here is our code for the local button click event. And what's this? Now, we already have a variable x that is, you know, public and shared. It's essentially a global or form level, module level variable that uh, has the value 5. Can I have another variable that is also named x? Well, in fact, I can. This is a different scope. So just like we might have uh, a governor of California who happens to be named Arnold, we could uh, um, have a uh, uh, oh the the uh, um, uh, county um, uh, supervisor could be named Arnold. And so when we're talking in Santa Barbara County, assume that our our uh, county supervisor is named Arnold. If we talk about Arnold up in the government. By default, in that context, we know we're talking about the most local uh, reference to Arnold, which means Arnold, the county supervisor, not Arnold, the uh, governor. And so the same is true here. Just like we can have students in, the, in one class that are named, I might have a student in one class named Bill, I might have a student in another class named Bill. They don't have to be the same Bill. In the context of the, those classrooms, then, um, you know, there's no collision, there's no ambiguity. Bill in one class means Bill Smith, and Bill in the other class means Bill Brown. If I do happen to have two Bills in the same class, then we need to fully qualify the name. That's a whole other discussion, and there's a way to uh, what we call disambiguate um, the uh, the variable there. We can use something called a scope resolution operator. We can We can deal with that. But let's keep things simple for now. Just rest assured that if we need to use both the, the global, the governor, governor Arnold and supervisor Arnold uh, in the same conversation, there is a way that we will be able to do that. But for now, let's see what happens when we press this button. So what should happen is we're going to uh, 
uh, declare a local variable x. This one is going to be a value of 98. And what we want to focus on is having a local variable with a value of 98 named x is in no way going to interfere with having our um, you know, greater scope variable, our form level or module level or our global level variable named x that has a different value. The two are separate. They have different addresses in memory, even though we're using the same moniker, the same nickname, uh, the same variable name for them because the scope differs. Now, <laughs> that is obviously pretty confusing. We actually try really hard to avoid this situation using careful naming conventions. Okay, but uh, generally speaking, uh, a program will get in the habit of, of looking up to see, hey, what, what are my declared local variables? And in fact, the best practice is to use local variables as exclusively as possible so that we don't have to inherit or don't have collisions with the variables that have a greater scope. And we, again, down the line, we're going to see how that we can have uh, inter-process communications, how one um, uh, event uh, handler can communicate with another event handler and pass values back and forth other than by sharing a global scope variable. That's That would be one way to do it, but it's not really the best way. Again, that's an upcoming conversation. So let's focus on this. So I've got variable X, gonna be 98. Um, we'll talk about some var, uh, another variable uh, in a moment. I've declared that as a thousand. And then, um, so before I use X, notice I did one other thing here, kind of funky, and I'll tell you, show you why that I did that in a couple minutes as we do another demonstration. But we're adding one to X, so 98, it's gonna be 99. And then we output, I'm outputting a little different message here. I'm telling you the variable X has the value and the value of X, which in this case should be 99 and not five. And then I'm also giving you what the variable value is for some var, which should be a uh, thousand. And then again, I've got a breakpoint set here. It should stop and give us a chance to look at the uh, variable watch window values and talk about things. So let's run this again. I'm gonna hit F5. Okay, so let's go ahead and show local. And it says local scope X has value 99. So it was 98 plus the one is 99, just as we expected. And the local scope variable has value 1000. And I say, okay, and the breakpoint comes up and look, here's X only look at this, that little widget that said that the, that was a larger scope or there was something different about that X. This is a regular local scope variable and its value is 99. Now, remember that if I go to debug, I can continue the code without just letting it all run. I can run a line by line by hitting um, F10. Okay, so I'm gonna hit F10 and um, step um, uh, uh, in, over each line of code going forward. So I hit F10 and it comes down to end sub and now I'm back here looking at this, but it's broken again. So I can look at my, um, oh, F10 looks like it continued the run. Let's go ahead and, and start that over again. Let's show the local and Okay, so 99 and 1,000, and then um, here we are, and let's see, on this debugger, okay, step over, they're using Shift F8. They've changed one of the, in this version of Visual Studio, they've changed my defaults. F10 used to be the, the step over key. So let's try Shift F8. So Shift and F8, oops, let's come back into context. Shift and F8, and we step forward, and here we are, and um, uh, let's go over and uh, you know, let's continue the run here. So I can just hit, oh, looks like I can already has continued the run. Okay, so hit F5 to make sure. Okay, so the run is continuing, and now let's say show global. And we come into here and notice that some var has gone gray. 
And that is because it is out of context. It does not even exist anymore. It's still in the watch window, but if we were to go and try and do something with it, so um, for example, in the immediate window, we can issue uh, commands just as if the, uh, the, the program had them. And so we can manipulate our variables. So I could say debug dot print the value of x and bam five is printed out okay but if i try and go debug dot print some bar it just it doesn't even know what to do with that there's no there's no value assigned to it okay so let's go back to our watch window it's grayed out it's out of context until we continue the run let me hit f5 and continue the run and so show global x has a value of five some var that's been updated now to show you it has a value of nothing so as soon as we left the local event handler where that um some var variable had scope um that variable disappeared entirely it, it doesn't even exist it was uh, given back to the memory manager and uh, garbage collection happened at some point and that's the point at which this got updated and it says well, it's nothing because there's there's no symbol there's no variable some bar that that even exists right now okay so let's continue our run f5 all right so let's play with this a little bit further um we understand that the global exists distinct from the local, that the local only really exists while it is in that uh, event, but that's kind of a problem, okay? We have a, we have a problem that happens there, and that is, what if we want this variable that was 98, it was incremented to one, it's 99, what if we want to make it go up by one every time we go through this um, this event handler we don't want it to forget that it used to equal 99 and now is 100 or the next time we run it that it equaled 100 and now it's equal to 101 well if the variable is going to go away because it's local scope well then we would have to we'd have no choice right but to use a a, a global variable or a form level module level variable a variable of greater scope well, I've already said that's not really a good thing to do because the greater the scope, the more likely you're going to have what we call namespace collision. That, that, that somebody's going to come up with a variable of the same name and they go changing stuff and they don't realize that they've whacked your code um, that or some other part of the code they worked on where they used that variable name before. It really could be kind of a mess. So we really want local scope. So how do we solve that? There is a special keyword. So we can take... Um, x instead of just dimensioning it declaring it we can say let's declare this as static and static is a special keyword it says when this goes out of scope don't allow the garbage collection the, the memory manager to throw this away we're going to hold on to it it won't really be used for anything it won't interfere with our global variable x but the next time we come back, if we ever do, into this context of this code, if this code is run again, it's not going to redeclare it with a dimension. It's going to say, hey, whatever it used to be, I'm restoring that. And so this incrementation, this modification to the variable is now going to have real meaning because it should change and it should remember that change in between runs of this portion of the code. So let's see if that works as we intend. Let's go ahead and run it. And uh, let's uh, show local and it's 99 and we say OK and uh, F5 to continue the run. And let's show local again. Oh, and now it's 100. And we say OK and F5 and show local and now it's 101. So it's working, right? And just to make sure for your doubters, let me go ahead and, and uh, stop the debug. And let's change this back from static to a normal dynamically dimensioned variable. Let's run the code again, F5, and show local. 
and it's 99. I say OK. F5 to run it again, show local, still 99. So it's no longer incrementing, or actually, it's incrementing from 98 to 99 each time, but it's getting every time this code runs, the variable gets redeclared, reinitialized to 98. <clears throat> we add one to it, so we never really make any progress there. So the way we can force that to preserve the variable value in between runs of this code is to make it static. And again, just to, to emphasize what we're seeing here, go ahead and restart this. Okay, so let's alternate between these two. Show global, x is 5, OK, continue the run, F5, show local, it's 99, OK, F5, continue the run, let's show global, still 5, OK, F5, show local, and there it is at 100, so we see it preserving the value. And we can watch the context change as we run this code. And again, let's shift F8 to continue to step over that. And notice that um, when we come back in to show global sumvar, which doesn't exist in the context of the show global um, code, and it's not um, a global variable, so sumvar has gone gray. X, that's in context, has that little modification there to the icon that shows you that that's a um, global scope or a, a module scope form scope variable. And so we're talking about the global X and not the local X. Uh, that said, um, if we notice this kind of thing in our code, <laughs> we'd really um, be better off either <clears throat> refactoring our code to get rid of this public variable if we're dependent upon it, or at the very least, renaming this variable so there's less confusion. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, some, some of these things you just have to play with a little bit uh, on your own and experiment before it really sinks in what's happening here. Um, using the debugger and stepping through is a great way to explore that. Now that you've achieved some mastery of variables and scope and uh, those kind of things, how to use the variables, um, let's introduce another concept, and that is the concept of a constant. The whole point of the variable was that it can be changed in value at any time that the program is running uh, to update uh, a calculated value. Uh, occasionally, there are values that we need to reference that we never, ever want to change um, during the, the time the program is running uh, because it could confuse things. Let's have a little story about how that can happen. So here is some code uh, originally written uh, back in, let's say, 2015. And uh, it's a console program, and its job is to calculate uh, the formula uh, or calculate the area of a circle and we know uh, from basic geometry that the area of a circle is pi times r squared. Okay, And so our first programmer uh, diligently uh, coded this up and he said, okay, I'm going to create a variable named pi as, as decimal. I'm going to use an approximation of pi and everything we do with pi is going to be an approximation because um, you know pi is an irrational number it, it, it never actually ends it keeps going out and on and on and on and on so we would choose the 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 level of uh, precision that is necessary for our purposes and so if we don't need um, precision more than um, hundreds of a unit uh, then 3.14 is a defensible uh, approximation for pi Okay, so let's take a look here when we run this, and uh, so I hit F5, and it says the area of a circle of radius 1000 is uh, 3140000. Okay, that, that looks good. Okay, so the programmer's uh, done their job, and then uh, let's say that uh, she got promoted, uh, moved on to a better job, some time has passed, uh, let's say about three years, and let's also imagine that our code has grown. And so instead of being right here where you can readily see it, let's say that the new code is like some 
50,000 lines down the screen uh, in a totally separate module, um, <clears throat> but uh, all sharing uh, global variables and that kind of stuff. So Pi still exists. You know, when this programmer co comes along and tries to declare Pi, they find out it, it already exists. You get, you get an error like, oh, okay, I'm not going to fight that. And they just need to make sure that they're using the precision that they intend. And they happen to be duplicating. They didn't check their code very carefully. They're duplicating something a, another programmer has done, and that is to calculate the radius of a, or the area of a circle with a radius 1000. And so they've come in, they've dutifully put in pi, they've entered their formula correctly. The difference is that they're using a great deal longer precision for their purposes, and maybe the business requirements have changed. That may be perfectly reasonable. The problem is that we now have this old legacy code, and we didn't really notice it. And so when we run the code this time, we can imagine that there was the first output that told us that the radius of, uh, uh, or the area of a circle of radius 1000 is 3140000. And here, later on, we're getting contradictory information. They cannot both be right for our purposes. If our purposes are, are correctly, you know, spec'd, if we've, we've got the specifications, one of them's now going to be right, and one of them's now going to be wrong, and it's going to cause confusion and problems. If this is a machine tolerance and we're machining parts, one of them is going to fit, the other one is not. Okay, so um, it's created a problem. So 3141593 is not the same as 3140000. Okay, so um, that's a problem. How could we make sure that programmer number two could never change this? Well, one of the things that we provide is instead of a variable, it's a constant. And so let's come up here and let me uncomment this. And let's say that programmer number one has declared that. We go to do the build and uh, compile it. So let me hit F5 and oh, let's uh, rebuild that. And let's uh, make sure we're in the same scope here. I should have put this actually here for this demo. Okay. Now, notice as soon as I do this, I get squiggly lines, IntelliSense errors under Pi. And if I try and build it, it says there are errors. Now, don't, don't run the last good code. Local variable Pi is already declared in the current block. Constant cannot be the target of an assignment. We can't change it once it's been declared. So we come find where our errors are. Easiest way, if we had 50,000 lines of code, is double click here. It'll take us right to it. And let's go ahead and change it. We can comment it out. We could delete it. Um, we could put in comments. Um, eliminated by JB replaced with constant per best practice. Okay, so leave a little history, a little uh, breadcrumb if that's important to your shop standard for documenting things. And we need to do the same thing at the next error. So I'm going to copy my comment. And if we come and try and build it again, there's still an error left. No. Now come find the item. Double click on it. Takes us right to it. We'll comment it out. Oops. Not change it. And eliminated by JB. Replaced with constant per best practice. So now the value is declared once and never ever allowed to change. A constant can't be changed. It will create a, an error if we try. Let's see if we get a consistent result. Now we're uh, getting a consistent result. That's at least to the good. 3140000 for both the calculations, which should be identical. Let me go ahead and end that. And so now, 
as a best practice issue, we have one place in the code to change it. So for you Tolkien fans, one ring to rule them all. Um, <clears throat> only one place that we need go to to make this change. So now if our business requirement changes and we now need um, higher level precision, 1593, we get the additional level of precision in there. Um, uh, save and rebuild our code again. F5, it built and ran correctly, and now we're getting the higher precision, but we're getting a consistent result. And uh, especially if these outputs were separated by, you know, reams of paper and 50,000 lines of code, uh, it might be hard to detect. It might go unfound for some time in production and cause us uh, endless uh, loss to the business and costs and unhappy customers and all those kinds of things that we want to avoid in business, um, especially as software engineers. And so uh, by using a constant, we get that benefit. There's also one other potential benefit. It depends on the language and the compiler that, we're, that we are using. And uh, to discover whether that is whether what I'm going to tell you is true, <coughs> excuse me, for uh, uh, Visual Basic, I'll leave that as an exercise for the student, which is to say I don't know offhand and I'm too lazy to go look. Um, so you can look it up. But the other thing, using a constant in some languages, this is going to get cached in the symbol table. We already talked about variables and how uh, in a memory managed uh, space like uh, the .NET language and, 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 and framework and the VB.NET, um, you know, it will uh, move things around as memory is consumed and becomes available and it's made free again and whatnot. All that moving around and means we have to look it up. Where, where is that address stored? When we dereference a variable, takes a little bit of time. In some languages, the symbol table is going to be cached, and that means it doesn't have to go through as many steps to look it up in memory. It has it in a handy little table that's already in, in cache, and uh, you know, we can get a little more efficiency out of it. Um, that kind of tuning is not usually the level of tuning we do in VB. VB is is uh, uh, kind of uh, headed toward uh, general business productivity programming, not fine tuning high performance stuff. But still, um, let's let's learn to use best practice. It's going to make you a better programmer, and better programmers, uh, you know, have better careers and are more highly paid. So let's do the right thing. And so I, I mentioned that as well. And if anybody uh, cares to take the time to look up and see if there's any performance efficiencies in the current version of the .NET framework when using um, constants, um, uh, please share that with the class. This concludes the lesson.